All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Can everyone hear me OK? In the back? Perfect. OK. Well, yep, I'm, Zach. I'm a software developer and data scientist at Pivigo. And what I'll be talking to you about is what has been my pet project for the past couple of months, working on some weekends. And the project specifically was building a robot that would automatically film rugby matches. And so in this talk, I'm going to be talking specifically about some of the problems that I solved to overcome this. But the more general uh, points of the talk will be about how you can do certain things whilst you're building a machine learning model to make it more efficient to run on low power devices. Things like uh, physical computing, low power devices like Arduinos and Raspberry Pis. So to start off with, I'd be interested to find out how many people, raise your hand if you've heard of or worked with physical computing. Perfect. I've got a slide for that. So physical computing, all it is is any sort of system that you have which doesn't use a keyboard, mouse, and monitor as the inputs and outputs. Instead, you use more tangible inputs. So these can be just buttons, sensors, cameras. That sensor there is that's a, a sonar sensor that you find on the back of cars to help parking, those sort of things. And the inputs this could be simple inputs or outputs, LEDs, motors, your just toaster, things like that, literally anything. And if you have those as the inputs or outputs of your systems, you can sort of say it's a physical computing system. So if you were to Google physical computing proje projects online, what you'd find is the majority of them use one of these uh, platforms. So you've got Arduinos and Raspberry Pis. So I'm sure those maybe ring a bell with some people. So all these are, are they're just small, low power computers. They're very cheap. They're less than about 20 pounds. But what makes them really good is they have these pins here. So you've got these sharp ones, and these, sort of, these are female ones, and these are male ones. And what's really good about these, these are called general purpose input and output, or GPIO. And on the code level, you have incredibly granular control over these. So you can specifically tell one to turn on, tell one to turn off, tell one to read a signal. And that's what allows you to connect them to virtually any device you can think of. So these are really good for connecting devices. but because they're cheap, because they're, they're well used, they tend to be low power. So the Arduino is about 16 megahertz, so minuscule. You can't really do much real number crunching with it. The Raspberry Pi is a bit more beefier. It's about the same power as your run-of-the-mill smartphone. So you could potentially do more number crunching with it. And that's what I talk about further, is how we can do these complex, specifically machine vision problems uh, on the Raspberry Pi. So speaking of machine vision and machine learning, uh, machine learning, when there's, there's a lot of projects online that use machine learning on these devices, and the sort of common pattern that they follow is they'll build the machine learning model and then just pass them off onto like a web server and let the device act as kind of like a dumb terminal to just send simple web requests to the web server. So that the web server does all the heavy number crunching and the low power device just does the collecting of the data and feeding inputs and outputs. That's sort of the standard practice. However, this, I think, this is a sort of underuse of, of the technology because what you'll see here, like here's just a tiny Raspberry Pi. This is the size of them. And here's like a battery pack you use to charge your phone. So it's literally the case of plugging one in, and then it's now completely wireless, and that's booting up into the Wi-Fi and stuff. So these are incredibly portable devices. So what I plan to do with this project is to sort of demolish this model and bring the model onto the Raspberry Pi therefore making it incredibly portable. So these sort of things could then be implemented on like bicycles. You don't need to have connection to the Wi-Fi. So that's what I'll be talking about, about the problem I solve. So onto the problem specifically. Uh, it's kind of a, a grassroots problem. So back home in Northern Ireland, uh, rugby is pretty much the only sport you play. If you don't play rugby, you don't play sport. And initially, I was in the latter category. I would just watch. I was more interested in video editing and stuff. So what I would do is I would just film the matches and then take them home and edit them into highlight reels and montages with music and stuff. People loved it. And this worked great until I wanted to play as well. And I still wanted to record the matches. So what I do is I give the camera to someone else. And we wouldn't have a professional cameraman lying about. So it would probably be like a substitute on the side. And they wouldn't care as much as me about filming. <laughs> so the footage wouldn't, wouldn't be the best. It would be, uh, this is an extreme example. It's, it's not fair to them. They did try hard most of the time, but they, in the extreme cases, you would get this sort of footage. 
So in both cases, the footage would end up being shaky. In the extreme cases, you would just miss the match completely. <laughs> but in both cases, I required a human to hold the camera and focus uh, on, the, on filming it. So I figured this is, it requires a human, so let's see if I can automate it. So the plan was I would build a robot that would sit at the halfway point of the pitch. So it would sit there, and a lot of the times when I describe this to people, they seem to think that it, it will run up and down the side of the pitch. But to solve a simple problem, it's just going to stay there. It's not going to move. And there are already systems out there that do this sort of automatic filming, but they require you to wear like a tag on your ankle. And people don't like it when you ask them to do that. So I wanted the system to be completely passive. So to collect the actual input data, it would be a nice wide angle camera that just films everything. And then that's going to be the input data that feeds into the model. And then I'd have that control a proper camera uh, that's attached to like a motor servo that would then hopefully with a well-trained model will follow the action and hopefully work. So that was, that was the, that was the uh, plan. And through this, I'm going to show you how I built that up to a working prototype. So the things I used to actually build it, uh, it was just it was one camera, a Raspberry Pi, and a, it's a servo motor. It's basically a motor, except for the fact that you can specifically tell it what angle to point at. So they're the kind of things that are used in like RC planes and stuff. But the common thing between all these is that these are all cheap materials. Like all, all of this stuff will be about around 30 pounds, if you know where to look. Well, actually, just eBay is where to look. So it's about 30 pounds altogether. And what I'm doing specifically is, because this, this is a cheap computer, it can't run number crunching, like intense number crunching. And for this problem specifically, it's machine vision and real time. So what I'm going to be doing that now is to sort of show you the full process of building a model that is lightweight enough to solve this kind of complex problem, but fast enough to run on a Raspberry Pi. So the model I built, the sort of approach to building the model, standard approach initially was to collect the data, build the model, then as an addition, build the robot. Uh, this seemed like a good plan, except for the fact that the data that I was going to use for the model didn't exist out there. I couldn't mine it from somewhere. I would have to collect the data myself. And to collect this data, I would have to collect it as I would use it in the final system. So the data would have to come through the robot. So I'd, I'll alter the plan slightly and to build the robot first, then collect the data, then I can train the model. So it didn't, that wasn't too much of a, of a hassle, but it just meant I was kind of investing myself into the problem quite strongly from the get-go. So the robot design, I'm just going to whiz through this. It's kind of out of scope for Pi Data, but I'm just going to say have a tripod, uh, some sort of plastic body, the camera, the Pi camera mounted, mounted there, the fisheye lens, which is going to make it capture everything, servo on top, and specifically on top of the servo, it's going to be a generic camera mount so that I could just mount any camcorder. So effectively, instead of building a robot that records, I'm just building a robot that points. So wider applications, I guess, for that. And then on top of that, the camcorder, any camcorder. So the actual rod, I'm just going to waste through this, put on my 3D printing hat, design some stuff, 3D printed it all. I've got it. This is it right here. So it's literally just a case. And then you've got the servo on this. This is the servo bit. And then the platform on top is where the camera goes on top. So it's just a, it's not the, the nice looking thing. Like it didn't get designed by anyone really. It was sort of designed just pure functionality. So moving on, now that I've got the robot, I can collect the data. So what's really great about using Raspberry Pi for doing these sort of things is that Raspberry Pi is so widely used that there's libraries there for communicating with most of like the hardware that you're interested in using. So for the Pi camera, there's literally a library called Pi camera. And the line, you create the camera object. And then I wrote a really simple function, which just takes the current time as a string of, of the milliseconds and then captures the image and then saves the image as the file name being the time that it was captured. So I end up with a big folder after I run it of all the images with the file names, the time that the images were captured. So this is what the data looks like. So it kind of looks like, have you ever seen 2001 Space Odyssey? Sort of Hal's view if he was into rugby. And for all the data I collected, I collected about 6,000 images over the course of two matches at a rate of about three FPS. So that was, that was all the data, which is great. Very excited, all that worked. Then came the sort of dark side of collecting your own data, which means that if you collect your own data, 
you have to label your own data. So I, if you've ever had to collect your own data set, this is the bit you don't look forward to. So, because it's, it's incredibly repetitive, incredibly boring, but this is incredibly important because the quality of the data will affect the quality of the model. And in this case and scenario, I know I'm going to be using a neural network. So the better quality data I can feed into it means the more aggressively I can try to shrink down that neural network. And the smaller the neural network, the faster it will run on the Raspberry Pi. So collecting this data and collecting it well and labeling it well is incredibly important for this application. So usually when I'm labeling data is for previous projects, I would just boot up into like a spreadsheet app, go through it line by line, label the data. It's boring, but it has to be done. But in this specific case, I'm labeling image data. So this won't really be convenient because what I'll probably have to do is have the images on some sort of image viewer, have the spreadsheet in a different window, look at the image, then go over to the spreadsheet. So I would want to label them like this. So if the left-hand side is 0, the right-hand side is 1, I want to label them where the action is happening in that scene. So I'm going to have to look at the image, guess where it is, then switch to the next image, guess where it is, type it in. Really tedious, really boring. And because it's so tedious, it opens the room for a lot of error to be introduced into labeling the data. And errorous data, I, want, I don't want that. I want really clean data. So I figured I could solve this problem. Well, not solve it completely. I could help it by building a little GUI. So this was actually the first time I realized that I could build a GUI in Python. So Python actually has a GUI library built into it called tkinter. It's kind of like if you've worked with Windows Forms, which probably no one has. <laughs> but uh, it's really simple. You say, here's a button, and run events on buttons. So I built a little GUI to help me. So I'll run this. Hopefully, you can sort of see my mouse moving. So what this GUI I built does is it shows me an image. Uh, I can move the mouse, and it shows a line as to where the mouse is. And every time I click, it saves the image name along with uh, where I clicked on the image. And I added in some extra features, like if I right click, it will set the image to null, which was, I, that was actually an important feature. Because when I started filming and collecting data, when you place a camera at the side of a rugby pitch that automatically is taking pictures, people will mess with it. That's just that's rugby players for you. They'll mess with anything. So there was a lot of images of people bending over towards the camera. So I had to introduce this feature. And I also added in extra features to allow me to using the arrow keys, go back, see the labels, adjust the labels, things like that. And, a, and one more extra feature was, even though I did make this and it, was, it made it a lot easier, it was still a bit boring. So I added in a feature that when I closed the app and I reopened it, it would drop me off at the next image I needed to label. So I could label a couple of hundred, get bored, close it down, open it, label the next couple of hundred. So that helped massively. So now I've, I've got really good, accurate labels, and that's going to help future when I'm training the model and pruning the model with the, with the good data. So that was the data labeling. Next, now that I've got the data labeled, I can do something really fun, which is the feature engineering part. So for this, this is the, this is the visualization of the data. But keep in mind that in Python, this, actually, this data exists as a numpy matrix. Specifically, it's the width of the image by the height, and then three frames for the R, G, and B. So it's, I think it's 480 by 640 by 3. Uh, so that's the, that's the way the data looks in Python. So the question is, looking at the visualization, as a human, can I solve the problem with this information? And could I solve it with less information? So it's the question of, could I solve it with less data? Or could I, could I reduce the amount of data but keep the information? And if you look, you see it's captured all the width, which I'm interested in. But it's also captured loads of height. It's captured planes, planes fly, flying past. And like maybe if there's a cat, a cat scuttles past, it captures all that stuff, which I don't really care about. So because it's numpy, I can do just a simple uh, index split or a splice, reduce all that. And then the question is, can I still solve the problem? And if I can, then the model can still solve the problem. And after I do this, it's a fifth of the pixels to process. It doesn't, it doesn't, that doesn't technically mean it speeds up the system by five. It just means five, a fifth of the work for the system to do. So continuing on with the feature engineering. Uh, this, this amount of data, this 100 by 640 by 3, is still a lot to feed into a neural network. Like if you consider one frame of this information and you show it to like a baby and tell it where the action is happening, 
it, it doesn't know what these colors mean. It doesn't know what these blotches are. So to train a model on this would still take a fairly complicated model. So the, there's, a, there's a little trick you can do in machine vision to isolate movement. And it's pretty simple. So all it is, if you can imagine an image, this is the way the image looks to Nupi. So we've got a tree and stuff with the numbers. And you've got a frame that's different. What you can do is, because these are just Numpy matrices, you can minus one from the other. And all the pixels that are the same value will cancel each other out in the final frame. So you end up with just a frame of the things that moved. So you can do this. This is how you isolate movement. And to do this in Numpy, it's literally just that, what, the frame minus the other frame. And then I add in this threshold value. So cameras have a natural sort of noise about them. So if you do this with, with a normal image, you'll get a lot of like pixelated noise everywhere because the camera's not going to take the exact same image. So I add in a threshold value to make sure I'm, I'm only capturing the images or the pixels that have changed by a lot. So I just choose an arbitrary value, which gives me a decent enough uh, focus on the bits that change a lot. So after I do this, uh, I do that. And then the, the threshold binarizes. So it sets the ones that have changed enough to 1 and the ones that haven't changed enough to 0. And we end up with an image look like this. So this is, as I hope you agree, is, is that sort of taking out the important bits of the image. So it's keeping the information, but reducing the data. So this is the, this is not, I'm on a, a good track. So if you show this to a baby, and if you can explain to the baby to look at the interesting parts of the image, it should, you would think that, okay, well, there's, this is the only bit I can see, so I'll just look at that. So you can see this, the simplification of the data. So looking at the, if we look at the original image, it's 100 by 640 by 3. We calculate that, well, I, call, I call it a delta image, it's just the difference of frames. So we reduced it by 3. And then there's actually another thing we can do to this data. So there's still information which we don't care about. So I, the camera, I'm only interested in turning it along the horizontal plane. But we're capturing vertical data as well in this. And I don't really care about that. I don't care if a person's like uh, at the bottom of the frame or at the top of the frame. So I can just eliminate that. And so what I can do is I can just, along each column, each pixel, I'll just sum up the total number. And this is, this is Numpy saves the day again. You can just sum up along that axis. And so we've reduced this down to just a vector of just the information that we care about. And we can do the same, the same sort of rule of thumb, which is as a human, now that I can see all the data, can I still solve the problem? And hopefully I think you can sort of see now where the action's moving, and it's a lot less than having a color image. Although that's kind of biased towards the people who are closer to the camera. Right? Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but then when you consider the, the end problem of just filming the interesting stuff, if a person gets in front of the, the camera, that's, it's going to capture it anyway. So. But then, with, if it, yeah, it's true. If it is biased, except that hopefully if a neural network is trained properly, it will know to ignore that bias. Because if it sees movement happening in a specific direction, it will capture it. That was, that was a good point. It can be biased to people being close to the camera. But hopefully, in the future, I'll help to alleviate that bias. Good point. <laughs> uh, yes, so now that I've got the data, moving on to the neural network. So uh, I'm just going to whiz through this, because it was more for about the implementation. But the neural network I used was the MLP regressor. So the regressor, because I'm predicting a continuous value from 0 to 1. Uh, the MLP, because I believed it would be a sort of non-linear problem. So I did, I did do the hyperparameter uh, optimization and testing and pruning and trying to find the smallest possible neural network that would give me a good bang for buck performance. And I ended up with a structure which would have 20 input nodes one hidden node and 33, well, one hidden layer th with 33 hidden nodes and one output node. And this actually gave me an R squared score of 0.8. So to keep in mind, a, an R squared score of 1 is like a perfect solution. So 0.8 for this, for building the prototype, was good enough for me. So I was ready to move on with that. So a visualization of this sort of performance that it's getting. So here is a plot. The orange values are where it's supposed to be predicting. The blue values or where it's actually predicting. The, uh, along the bottom is time. And along the top is where it should be looking. So at the bottom, it's looking to the most left of the image. Top, it's looking to the most right. So here, a lot of action happened on the right. A lot of action happened on the left. Probably a try was scored here. So as you can see, hopefully visually, that they match up decently. Uh, the bits where it's a bit off uh, for this specific problem is actually not too much of a problem, because 
the way the camera captures, it doesn't capture exactly one point, it captures quite a, a nice wide angle. So if it's slightly off, hopefully the action is, actually, is still captured. So I, I don't mind that it's slightly off at some points. So that was the model, I was happy with that. Now, time, now comes the time to just wrap it up and bundle it into the Raspberry Pi. So what's handy is that I'm sure a few of you are familiar with pickling, which is just taking a, taking a Python variable and persisting it or saving it to a file so you can reanimate it later. So sklearn has a nice little wrapper around the standard pickle library to make it even easier. So I can just, I put my model, give it a name, it's going to dump it as a pickle file. I can just copy and paste that over to the Raspberry Pi, because the Raspberry Pi is just, uh, well, I have mine just running Linux, so it's literally a case. I can even bring a USB stick, plug it in, copy it over, or I can SSH into it and copy it over, but it's just a case of copying the files over and then loading them, and it's just as easy with the, with the library to just load in the model. And so now that I've got the model, the next case was actually using the model in the Raspberry Pi. So this is where I land on the final trick of getting this sort of thing to work. So the initial solution involved writing a program which would first capture the image, uh, then using the model to predict where it was, what was actually, where the action was happening, and then move the server. And then this would just run in like a while loop. So I did this, and it would move the server, except for the fact that if you were to run it like this, uh, for the system, you want to capture as many predictions per second as possible. If you capture only one prediction per second, there's going to be a second of time where something else could happen on the other side of the pitch. So you want to have a nice tight loop around getting predictions and moving the server. So to do that, uh, it meant that for this uh, structure, I could just spend a very small amount of time moving the servo, specifically just one execution. And when you do that, what's going to happen is the servo is going to come along, and then when it moves the servo, it's going to move it really quick to one side, and then something else happens, move it really quick to the other side, which doesn't solve one of the initial problems that I wanted to solve, which was reducing the shakiness of cameras. So this didn't work. What I could do to solve this is spend a bit more time on moving the servo, so I could have wrote a little loop around that servo to slowly increment it across. But like I said earlier, this will affect the latency of actually getting predictions. So yes, one, ex one execution does not make smooth. So if you want to use multiple, you can smooth it out. So one powerful trick in Python is you can use multiprocessing. So don't let anyone tell you that you can't do multiprocessing in Python, because there is a way to do it. So what I can do is I can capture the image, predict the action, run that in its own process, and then over in the servo, have it in its own process as well. And so between them, what's going to happen is the, the image is going to get captured. It's going to predict the action. And then it's going to update a shared variable. And then it's going to keep doing that. It doesn't care about anything else. All it cares about is getting predictions and updating that shared variable. And then the, move, the uh, servo mover is the same thing. It doesn't care about anything else. All it's caring about is reading this shared variable and updating the position. So it's free to take as long as it wants to move that servo nice and smoothly. So what's handy is if you've ever done a bit of web development, you've probably heard of like easing functions. So I can, there's also Python libraries for that, for e just copying in an easing function. So I can add in this nice smooth movement to the camera. So this is all good in a visualization, but the actual code is surprisingly simple. So there is a library already built into Python for this called multiprocessing. And you import process and value. And when you start your script, you declare your shared variable. And then I declare the process or one of the process. So this specific one is the process for camera tracking. So I'll, in my code, I have a function that defines the camera tracking code. And in that is just a while loop doing the capturing and predicting, capturing, predicting, capturing, predicting. And then I pass it the shared variable at this stage. And in my function, the function takes in a variable. So all it's doing is updating that variable. So we do that. We create a process, start the process. Then we create a process for the servo, exact same way. It servo is just a little. A function that has a while loop in it. It's just going around, updating the servo, updating the servo. And in each of these functions, they're manipulating the shared variable just by calling the shared variable name dot value. And that's how you use the shared variable. The uh, camera tracking code updates that value just by saying it to equal something like that. And then the servo process just reads that value. And it, it works. It just, it just works beautifully, that code. <laughs> uh, final bit of implementation is now that I've got the script on the Raspberry Pi, 
the Raspberry Pi is just running Linux. So as soon as I turn it on, it's going to boot up into Linux, sit on the command line, and wait for you to do something. So on the side of a rugby pitch, it's not really convenient to bring keyboard, mouse, and monitors to set up this script. So what you can do, there's a nice little trick is to, there's this file that exists on Linux. And all that file has is all the command line commands that get run as soon as it logs in. So you can open it up in the nano text editor and just add in the line of code that you want to run as soon as it turns on. So for this, it's just running this script here. So this is the script to collect the images. So I add that to the bottom of that file, save it. Every time I plug in the Raspberry Pi, it boots up without any sort of user input and begins running that script. So that's a really handy tip uh, if you're building these sort of things. So finally, after I've done all that, I've got the robot. It's finished. It's sitting there. Ignore the cable management. Uh, I'm much more stringent at work with cable management than in these sort of projects. So that's the, that's the image of it. So I wouldn't, it wouldn't be right to show you it without some video. So here's a video of it actually in action. So hopefully you can see rugby happening and it turning towards the rugby. So that's all great. But this highlights a sort of issue with the problem that's, that, they, that still exists. So what I would have loved to have done is to show you this footage alongside the footage that it actually recorded. However, the system cannot help you if you forget to press record on that camera. <laughs> uh, a future feature, maybe some sort of sign or sticker. But currently, I, I forgot to press record on that footage. Uh, footage that I did remember to press record on was this specific incident. Now, the eagle eye among, among you may have noticed I've got this nice bit of NHS jewelry. So if you look closely, I'll probably have to play this a couple of times. So it's rugby, rugby, here I come, here I come. And then I, I lay down and have a little cry. And then <laughs> what you see is the, the robot is still focused on me, even though there's movement happening everywhere. Pardon? Exactly, that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> Potentially, the model could feel empathy for me or detect pain. All these things possible. Pardon? Yeah, exactly. I, I don't know what it was. But potentially, it shows in the future, I could uh, build a model that detects uh, injuries, pain, its owner, things like these, all future possibilities. So that's one instance. So I'd like to show you just a full match being played. Obviously, it's sped up. I'm not going to make you watch a full match of rugby. So this is it. This is actually the first, uh, this is still a first prototype. So. I'm quite chuffed that it managed to perform this well. And a super interesting point is that all this, this, this match specifically is being played on a different pitch from the pitch I collected the data for to train it. So that goes to show that the bits I did to abstract the important information seem to work. So now it is just caring about movement and blotches of movement. So that goes to show that it, is, it does work and it does work on across multiple pitches. You can see it still, it still lags behind some points. But for the most part, first prototype, it's something I'm going to work on. And it's hopefully going to be better in the future. So final point is just to reiterate that physical computing is pretty cool. And it's even cooler with machine learning. And I think it's sort of underused at the moment. And I think we should more try to think about embedding machine learning into these remote applications, because you can just build pretty cool stuff with it. Uh, Finally, just like to say thank you for listening. Thank you for PyData. Thank you for Marco, who's mentored me and helped me prepare for this. And yeah, thank you. So we have time for questions. Oh, shit. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I was just wondering with your, uh, your training data set, have you considered sort of incorporating a delay? So you have your train data sets plus one second, and then you train against that rather than training against. So see if it could predict the next where the next bit of action is happening. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I, I was thinking about that's like a future thing I was thinking of doing. So yeah, yeah. that would be a thing to look out for. Um, yes. Thanks. That was a terrific talk. Oh. <laughs> Yes. Uh, yeah, just it was uh, for building the prototype. I, I chose the first thing that worked. 
So I didn't look, I've heard, I've, I, it was on my mind, but Googling, this was the first result. <laughs> but it, and it seemed to work quite well. So yeah. How, how well does it react to rapid uh, changes in direction, so like a turnover or something like that? Uh, at the moment, the current system, I think it's, it's predicting at about like two frames a second. So that's the sort of reaction time that it has. Yes? Oh, so like, have, I, have I profiled the code to see the actual speed of it? Actually profiling the, the load on the, on the device. Oh, no, not at the moment. That's a future thing, too, because I will be continuing to work on this. So in the future thing, I'll be looking more into analyzing the true performance that it's, and, it's, and how much it's utilizing the Raspberry Pi. But yeah. Yes? Uh, I've got two questions, actually. So um, how, does it, um, how does the Raspberry Pi module um, last in terms of the battery? Um, uh, I mean, because this is like, I'm assuming the game lasts about an hour or so. Yeah, it's about 40 minutes. Um, so are you relying on, uh, are you doing anything to uh, do battery performance optimization? Uh, at the, the current system, uh, I don't really consider battery performance at all. Uh, I, lit, I use these battery packs that you get for charge your phones because they plug into USB-C and the Raspberry Pi has USB-C on it. And this one shows the indicator of how much power is in it. Uh, after I record a match, it's also powering the servo motor and it doesn't even go down one bar. So they are, they're all low power devices. So it, it, it safely covers a match. I think it could cover a full week of matches on just this. But yeah. Uh, second question, are you going to share the code? Oh uh, yeah, the code's all on GitHub, so oh. you can follow it. It's a bit messy at the moment. I'm going to be cleaning it up. Uh, but yeah, the code's all there. It's all open source. Uh, it's going to stay open source. But yeah. Yes? I noticed your source material wasn't quite um, sort of flat. Oh yeah, it was a bit, a bit angled, yeah. Is it sensitive to that sort of... Um, uh, I, I haven't tested to see how sensitive it is. I do take care to try to get it as level as possible. Um, I can imagine the way I train the data, as long as the main bit of action is happening within that window, it's fine because I sum it all up. So I'm guessing any, there's, a certain, there's gonna be a certain point where if it gets too far, it should, it should freak out a bit. But as long as it's generally capturing that in that sliced window, it should be fine. <coughs> yes? Yes. <laughs> uh, in the future, I'll I'll work on the cable management. Uh, for for training the model, uh, I was just doing normal sort of grid search of the hyperparameters of the neural network. So just testing out things like iterating over the neural net size and plotting out the performance and just picking one that was the best bang for buck to try to minimize the size of the neural network. And I did that for the other things like learning rate and um, what is it, regularization? But yeah. OK. Oh. It, it seems that it's pretty good in um, individuating when the interesting thing is happening. Do you think confident enough to make it also zoom? Yeah, that is uh, a future a future, feature that I like to look into doing, potentially even, even uh, having multiple cameras. Because yeah. technically, if I have one camera at one end, one camera at the other, uh, the position they predict would also allow you to perfectly triangulate where it's happening, and then you could pass that data back to them to zoom in accordingly. So yeah, that is, would be a future feature that I'd like to look into doing. OK. I have a question. OK. Did you, did you show the graphs with the, 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 well, the R, well, the R score was 0 0.8? Yeah. But the, the ones, the ones with high frequency moving, have you thought of passing a filter to reduce, to reduce it? Uh, no. You can see I, the bigger, you can see there's, there's, there's more oscillations in the ones that uh, Oh yes, the predictions can be quite a bit erratic. Have you thought of passing a high oh, passing it back in like a sort of like a recursive neural network where I give it the no, previous so, value. So signal you can reduce oh, just high, reduce high the output. Mode. Oh, like a, like a momentum on the yeah. output. Yeah. Actually, looking at it now, yeah, I could do that. It would, so, which moves up the, the signal. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, would look into doing that. Cool. Oh. Uh, 
No, I haven't. Uh, it's mainly been rugby. <laughs> but that does sound like a much more worthy cause. But yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. Do you think you'll have any limitations when you're just tracking movement and action? And do you think like, you'll hit a point where you can start like, really recognizing players or the ball, for example, and tracking that and stuff? Or do you uh, think you'll be fine for the foreseeable future? I think, I hope that'll be fine. Because um, if the, the motions on a rugby pitch are usually quite simple, because everyone moves in the same way. Like if someone, if someone breaks the line, that's the only fast object moving in that direction. So I hope for this system it's going to remain a sort of simple problem. But potentially, if I'm building a more advanced model that's going to be able to pick out specific people, it could be using that. But for my simple use case, I hope it's going to remain as simple as, as possible. All right. OK, we don't have any more questions. Let's uh, thank Sag again. That's perfect.